Hello and welcome to episode 4 of the Reefcaster Studio 12 saltwater tank setup. In the last video I added my first coral to the tank and I completed the cycling process, so today I'm going to add my first fish to the tank and I'll show you how the corals are getting on now they've been in the tank for a month. Now the last video was filmed about 3 weeks ago, at which point the tank was cycled and my ammonia levels were zero, but I left the tank for another week before I added my first fish to make sure the ammonia didn't spike back up. And nothing changed over the course of that week, so I had the all clear. Now I normally choose clownfish as my first fish for any tank because they're very hardy and are a safe bet for the early stages of a marine tank. But over the years I've had numerous tanks with hundreds of different fish, so I wanted something a bit more unusual. And so when I saw what I was after in my local fish shop a few weeks ago, I bought him and put him in the sump of my main tank while I waited for the reef casser to cycle. And in my head I imagined the force of water entering a glass would be enough to scoop him up. But but that didn't even come close to working, so I resorted to netting him out, then decanting him into the glass, which did work. Now I didn't acclimate him to the new tank because the temperature and salinity in both tanks are almost identical, so I just plopped him straight in. And at first glance you might be thinking this is a Valentini puffer, but it's actually a mimic filefish impersonating a puffer. And my thinking is that this guy will be slightly more reef safe than a proper puffer while still looking just as cool. And despite the obvious taxonomic irregularities, I'm going to call him puff anyways. Now I have had filefish in the past and they've proven to be decidedly not reef safe. The two Aptasia eating filefish I've had previously nipped both LPS and SPS corals until I removed the fish, but they didn't ever eat my cleanup crew which a puffer probably would do. And this tank will be 100% soft coral so I have a better chance of success. And he hasn't touched any of my corals or snails so far, but at just two weeks in I won't be calling this a win just yet. Now before I added Puff I put the optional reef casa mesh cover on. Puff managed to jump between sections of my sump while he was in my main tank and he jumped out of the water while I was trying to catch him so he is very much a flight risk just like all other marine fish. And this tank will be too small for him long term so I'll need to upgrade or rehome him eventually and this isn't a fish I'd recommend for a tank like this especially if you're new to the hobby. Clownfish are a much better option and frankly look much cooler than this guy. Now I'll tell you more about Puff later, but now let's check in on the corals. And they're all doing reasonably well a month after they first went in. Half of the zoas were closed up for the first week or so, but they're now all completely extended and generally looking very healthy. They are stretching up towards the light a little bit, but that's because I still have the lights at just 20% while the tank settles in. And the zoas will be totally fine until I'm ready to ramp the lights up in a month or two. And the green Kenya tree is also doing reasonably well. It's not showing such good polyp extension as it was in in my established tank before I moved it over, but again it's totally fine and doesn't seem to be struggling as much as I thought it might. And the random flow generator attached to the return pump outlet is doing a surprisingly good job in terms of creating flow for the tank, and you can see it's waving the Kenya tree around nicely. I'll still look to add a power head at some point, probably a nice cheap Jekod SLW10, but this is totally acceptable flow for now, and the random flow generator is actually doing better than I thought it might do. And in terms of the ugly stage, I think I'm starting to see it now. In my last video I said I had an early outbreak of diatoms, but given they disappeared immediately after I turned the lights down, I think they were probably actually the much more problematic dinoflagellates and not diatoms at all. But I am getting a light brown dusting on the rocks now that probably is diatoms, and there's some light algae growth on the glass as well. Now that's totally normal of course, so I don't really need to do much about it, but I will pick up a few more snails and some hermit crabs next time I go to my local Local fish shop. And in the meantime I did my second water change, this time of around 50% to keep my levels in check and to take the edge off any spiky nutrients. Now I probably should have tested my water both before and after the water change, but I forgot to do the before test, so I may do with just testing afterwards. The last time I tested was a couple of weeks ago, at which point my nitrates were around 7 parts per million and my phosphate was at 0.07 parts per million, and this time they were at 4 parts per million nitrates and 0.06 ppm phosphate. At this stage I don't really have an ideal number in mind, just as long as they're not either very high or at zero. So those levels are totally fine, and to stop them bottoming out I didn't change the filter sponge this time when I did the water change. Now Fragbox did send me the optional housekeeper media basket, which you can use to hold things like phosphate removing media, bio balls, or activated carbon. But while it looks very nice and slots neatly into the filtration section, I'm not going to use it for the moment because my levels are nicely in check on their own. However, I am using a couple of 
other reef cutter upgrades that Fragbox sent me. The first is the reef cutter refractometer for measuring salinity. While the swing arm hydrometer that comes with the kit is better than nothing, a refractometer is vastly superior and a well worthwhile upgrade given salinity is the single most important parameter to keep an eye on in a tank like this. And the other upgrade I'm using is the filtration cover which makes the tank look a little bit neater and reduces evaporation by a smidgen. Back to Puff then and you might be wondering what I'm feeding him. Well I feed him frozen mysis because that's what I feed all of my fish. It's the one thing I find that any fish will eat so I don't have to worry about training him to eat dry food and my understanding is that pellet food is much more nutrient dense than frozen so by feeding frozen instead of pellets I won't risk adding too many nutrients to the tank which is particularly important at this early stage. Now Puff gets a fraction of one cube at each sitting and I only feed him once a day although I will look to feed him twice a day eventually when the tank is more established and can cope with a heavier bio load. Now the sponsorship deal with Fragbox for this series was for me to make four videos about this tank and because this is part four the mathematicians among you will have worked out this is the last in the series. So now I have to decide whether I'm going to keep the tank or shut it down. So if you'd like more videos on this, let me know in the comments below and I'll judge how popular this tank is as part of my decision. Realistically though, the only reason not to keep going is maintenance. I already have three other tanks, so the last thing I need is another body of water to test, three more panels of glass to clean, and another batch of water to mix up for water changes. But I reckon I could get away with a 50% water change once a month and scraping the glass just once or twice a week. And if I add just one or two more hardy soft corals like pulsing xenia, plus one more fish to keep Puff company, the tank should be relatively low maintenance. But given this might be the last time you see this tank, let me know if you've got any questions in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed the video series, give me a thumbs up and subscribe for more reefing goodness. And until next time, happy reefing.